Hello, welcome to the Relationship Masterclass. This is day 19, and my name is Samuel. It absolutely delights my heart to come your way. Uh, today promises to be an exciting session in, the, in this particular event. Uh, I'm very confident of the fact that uh, you're about to get some information, you're about to get some kinds of thoughts that will enable you to have an enrichment in your marriage and relationship. Uh, as it is our custom, I would always like to start uh, with some form of teasers. And um, today, I just want to hope again, I've hoped for a while, and men listen to my desire. I really look forward to the men helping us out when it comes to answering the questions that we sometimes put out to you. And if you have questions you would like to ask in the end of this broadcast, You'll be very free to actually, in the course of the broadcast, uh, prepare your questions in such a way that um, when the time comes to reach, you can just quickly post your questions. All right? Uh, but I want to start with question. I want to start with some teasers. Uh, yesterday, I talked about, or in the previous episode, I talked about uh, the four temperaments, the four major temperaments. Uh, that we have and how that they can affect our relationships and our marriages. Uh, what I want to do right now is to see who will be the first. Uh, some of you are so smart, you have the capacity to give me all at once. For the sake of us, would you be kind enough to just give us only one? So we don't have one baptizing us with the complete four. Okay? So let's quickly take a look at who is going to give me uh, the first. Uh, which of the temperaments do you remember? Which of the temperaments do you remember? I'm looking out for who's going to be the first right now. Which of the temperaments do you remember? I'm watching out for who's... I just, I just hope the guys will help me. Please, brothers. Oh, Lord, I just hope your brother does not mess this man of God up. Okay, so brothers, come quickly. Brothers, let the Lord lead you. Do this thing for us. Oh, no, it's, it's a woman again. Brothers, dear ye, said sanguine. Another woman, choleric. Ah, uh, another woman, choleric. Where are the guys? I King Hobare, another woman, choleric. So we have choleric, we have uh, sanguine, uh, princess, sanguine. Guys, fill up the space. We have the guy, oh no. Anita just brought in uh, phlegmatic. Oh Lord, Lord, help one of these brothers. Well, I think. The, the women just finished the Belinda just gave us melancholic. So, bros, where art thou? I, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> where art thou? Uh, someone once said, men don't keep those kind of facts. That men are always thinking about money, how to make the money. So women kindly recognize the fact that this might not be a good terrain for men to succeed as much as we would have loved them to do. I believe that when we come to talking about money, I think the men will rise up to the occasion. So I do hope that my defense on their behalf suffices. Uh, but guys, we need to wake up. <laughs> All right. Uncle Kevin, you said you posted. Matter of God, I, I didn't see. Oh, man. Kevin, I'm sorry. I didn't see your post. I, I really didn't see your post. So thank you for trying to redeem the man. And uh, next time when you are sending your post, send it with prayer, man of God, so, <laughs> so that the women don't overshadow us. Uh, only God knows why they didn't see it. Why we didn't see it, okay? All right. Well, today, I, I want us to take a look at some of the things that we said about Don't forget that we said yesterday 
that cholerics are individuals who are, when it comes to task, we said cholerics are high on task. When it comes to relationship with people, people who are cholerics have low orientation towards people relationship. So if someone is a task-oriented person, most times they are choleric individuals. But don't forget that melancholics are also task-oriented. So what differentiates between a melancholic and a choleric, even though they share similarity in that they both are task-oriented, what makes them different is the fact that uh, melancholics, take note of this, melancholics think before they act. Melancholics, they think deeply before they act. Reverse is the case with cholerics who are also task-oriented. They act before they think. So if you have a husband who is choleric, he would have slapped you first before he comes to the consciousness that you were the one he slapped. You get what I'm saying? Um, so after he has slapped you, then he realizes that he had slapped you. Uh, so they, are, they act before they think. All right? Uh, not only that, if you have a wife also who is choleric, uh, she would have also done the same, the same, before she thinks about what she has done. So, and don't forget that, again, what separates choleric and melancholics is that cholerics are extroverted. Cholerics are outgoing. Melancholics are introverted to the core. In fact, they are more introverted than the Phlegmatics. So if you have a husband who is choleric, don't forget these key characteristics or wife or someone you want to marry. Is that okay? If the person is choleric, the person will be high on task. I hope somebody is taking note of that. Let me see who is writing. Let me give you again number three things to remember about choleric people. Number one, they are high on task. Number two, they are extroverted meaning they are outgoing. Number three thing you need to remember about uh, choleric people is that they act before they think. So they are action-oriented. They are result-oriented. So take note of that basic stuff about them. I'm watching for who is able to write all of that out. Okay, so let's move on quickly. We don't, you can go back to yesterday's broadcast. I can't go into the details today. I'm just doing a summary for those of you that missed it yesterday. All right, then let's go over now to the melancholics. The melancholics, they are individuals who are also task-oriented. Some of them are usually singers, artists. They like to draw, paint, write songs. They are the type that come up with content, rest of that. They are usually very artistic, creative. They are mostly the people you call creatives. Most creatives are melancholic by nature. So they can be in a place and be so absorbed in what they are creating that they forget that they are somebody in the house who needs their love. Do you, do you get what I'm saying now? So they just forget that you are there. Once they are absorbed in their work, they just forget you. Yeah, you can wear your pajamas as a woman. You can wear your lingerie. You are parading around the house hoping and thinking that this creative will recognize your presence. Unfortunately, he is so absorbed. Don't be offended. It's their nature. They have to be nurtured out of it. Did you hear what I just said now? It's their nature. So they have to be nurtured out of it, meaning that it has to be counterintuitive for them to uh, be out of what they usually get absorbed in. 
The reason I'm sharing all of, you, all of this with you is that there are so many of us who are having breakups and divorces over ignorances that prevails over the fact that we don't even understand each other's temperament. So I hope I'm doing a good job. I hope I'm helping you. So you don't have to throw your guy away thinking that something is wrong with him or maybe he's demon-possessed. <laughs> Church people like, you know, you feel he's demon-possessed. Yeah, he has a demonic spirit. No, 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 it's not a demonic spirit. He has a temperament issue. There's a, it's his temperament. Uh, he gets absorbed. He has to be trained, nurtured out of that nature. Oh, kiddo. All right, let's get down now. So we said melancholics, they are task-oriented. Melancholics are usually very moody. They have lots of mood swings. Now they are happy. Later they are sad. You know, if you remember a man called D.L. Moody. So um, uh, melancholics are moody's. Yeah. Okay. So if you're married, guy, if you're married to a moody wife, if she comes from the tribe of moody, you understand what I'm saying now? Now you buy her a car. She's just happy right now. And you are like, praise God, my wife is happy. And then you get into the bedroom and you say, hi, sweetie. You are even thinking, you know, bros, you know, you're so excited. You bought a car. You are like, for those of you that are married, you are like, praise God. Today is the day this woman is going to give me a treat in the bedroom. And then you get to the bedroom. And you're like, sweetie, how are you? And then you start having those staccato answers. Thank you. I'm all right. Fine. Everything's okay. Uh, and you're like, sweetheart, eh? is anything wrong? No. But why are you talking like this? No problem. But you're, you're sounding different. You were excited downstairs. Did I tell you there's a problem? <laughs> uh, so if, if you have a, a wife that comes from the tribe of Moody, uh, it's just them. Uh, and most times, don't try to do anything. Just let them try to pet. If she's not responding, give her space. Give her space. Because sometimes trying to share space will aggravate her. So sometimes just give her space so that like the wick, like the tread in the candle, that moment will burn away. Right? Try to help if she responds to that. Fine, but if you notice she's irritated and aggravated by your attempt to share space, give her space. Give him space. Don't try to share space when he wants space. Right? <laughs> Ogbeni, you said, hope you are not one of the moodies. You are talking to, you are replying, uh, Ogbeni is replying somebody, like Ogbeni, I didn't send you to, <laughs> I didn't send you to reply somebody like that. Is that okay? All right. Let, let's get going. Men also, their excuses is why to be left alone. Um, I don't get what you're saying. But the bottom line is that sometimes people who are melancholic in nature, uh, some of them, by training maturity, when the mood swing comes, they will need your intervention to get them out of the situation. But there are so many who are uncultured, who are yet to be trained out of that state, who are still raw melancholics. What most of them want is space. Is that okay? So you have to know who you are in relationship with. Here's what I want to say. No one rule fits all. The whole idea is for you to have general understanding so that you can have specific application. So melancholic people, they are usually very moody. They are mood swings. Not only that, they are introverted. They like their space. And like we said, they are task-oriented. They are great thinkers. They are perfectionists. They are the individuals who are grossly, highly detailed by nature. Every T must be crossed. I's must be dotted. They are the types who, when they want to write an S, they will first of all stretch the head of the S before they bring it down and take the tail up again. You know, if you've ever been with any 
you, you know, it, it can be frustrating to be with them because you really don't know how to please them. When you sweep the house, uh, they're still going to find a grain of sand towards the corner of the house. Yeah, they have capacity for identification. They have this unique capacity. Uh, they are the type that will find a spider web inside the ceiling after you've cleaned the house. Now, how they expect you to find what they find sometimes is a mystery. But it's just their, it's just their inclinations and their proclivities. Is that all right? Well, let's move a little bit further. So can we go over to sanguines now? Or you call them sanguines. It, what, it, 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 you know, it all depends on whether you're speaking American English or British English. All right, but let's use sanguine for today. Now, when we're talking about sanguines, they are the type who like to talk before they think. Remember that cholerics act before they think. All right, now sanguines, they talk before they think. Melancholics, they think before they act. All right, so when you're dealing with sanguines, sanguines are the type that when you offend them, if you're you in relationship with a sanguine, I'm sure you recognize what I'm saying now. If you are in relationship with a sanguine, they will have broken up with you five to seven times before you marry. You remember that day at the restaurant while you guys were just having like pizza and something just happened. The, all of a sudden, your sanguine partner just got up and said, I'm done. I'm not doing again. And I take off the ring. Here's your ring. I'm gone. I'm, don't call me. I'm over. And all of that. And then as soon as the sanguine gets home, the sanguine was the one that said it's over. As soon as the sanguine gets home, the sanguine is waiting for your call. And it's funny enough to know that sometimes you're even calling the sanguine. Initially, the sanguine will not want to pick, your, pick up your call. And the sanguine is praying that you don't cut off the call. <laughs> you see, so sanguines are the type who don't read. Take note of this. Sanguines don't really mean what they say. So if you are a phlegmatic who is a thinker or a melancholic who is a thinker, please don't be in a hurry to take a sanguine seriously. For instance, when she's angry, she will tell you, I hate you. I hate the whole of your family. It's a mistake. I even married you. God forbid. What a useless marriage. I am done. I am over. I'm going. Tomorrow morning, I can't even wait for it to be morning. Tomorrow, I'll be on my way with the first available flight. I'm leaving the country. I'm leaving the marriage. Sanguines don't mean most times what they say. What actually drives sanguines is how they feel. They speak as they feel, not as they think. This is what separates a sanguine from a phlegmatic. A phlegmatic speaks as he thinks. So if your phlegmatic husband says, I want to leave this marriage. If your phlegmatic husband says, I will leave this marriage, you better take it seriously. Because phlegmatics think before they speak. Phlegmatics don't even say it until they have spent so much time to think through before they speak. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. Somebody's like, this is serious, right? Okay. So don't forget this today. There's a difference between... <laughs> Uncle Kevin said, sanguines are shakara people. <laughs> you know. So sanguines, please. I'm saying this because if you're married to a sanguine and you are a phlegmatic, the danger, now listen, sanguines are expressors. Phlegmatics are processors. The implication is that if a sanguine speaks, express his or sanguines will tell you how they feel. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they mean. Unfortunately for you who is a processor, as a phlegmatic, you will take their words seriously. And you will start drawing conclusions, inferences. And that causes problems in the marriage.
Well, thank you so very much. I'm sure that I've been able to push that through. Don't forget phlegmatic and sanguines are people oriented. Is that okay? Sanguines get their energy by relating with people. Phlegmatics, they lose energy by interacting with people. Don't forget that. So when a phlegmatic goes out to interact with your, for instance, if you are a sanguine wife and you are married to a phlegmatic husband, when the two of you go out to visit families and friends, watch this. When the sanguine wife is coming back, she is coming back supercharged because she gains energy by interaction. Now, sanguine, phlegmatic men, they lose energy by interaction. Sanguines lose energy by isolation. Phlegmatics gain energy by isolation. So when a phlegmatic husband gets back home, or a phlegmatic wife gets back home from a visit to friends, the first thing they want to do is they want to be by themselves to themselves. Now what happens is that the sanguine partner with the energy that the person has just gotten from interaction wants to be all around the phlegmatic when the phlegmatic wants to isolate, hibernate so that the uh, phlegmatic can recharge. The lack of recognition can cause confusion. All right. <laughs> All right, so we are getting into the heart of our discourse today. Before I go into what we have to share today, would you go ahead and share the video now? We have 60 seconds. Just look at the birth button left down the left-hand side of your phone and just simply press share like you type. It doesn't even take the energy of typing to share. Is that okay? So would you please let's rescue marriages together and relationships. So go ahead and please. Share. LS Sunlight, thank you for summarizing what I said already. I said, sanguines talk before they think they will break up with you, but will then be waiting for you to call, and then they, they will still not answer your call. Is that okay? Hoping that you don't cut your calls. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, so let's go ahead. Thank you very much, Neka, for sharing. Thank you so very much, uh, Jennifer, for sharing. I'm waiting on the others to share. I'm waiting. Michael, thank you so very much, sir, for sharing. Benga, thank you for sharing. God bless you all. All of you on YouTube, I'm looking forward to seeing you all to share. God bless you all. LS Booker, thank you for the great work you're doing on YouTube. LS Booker, I need to give you really an award for the great work you do on YouTube. All right? Fantastic work you do on the YouTube. Uh, Susan, thank you for sharing. Tony, thank you because you've already shared, shared. Shine Chris, Dan, good to see my brother Dan. God bless you, sir. Thank you too for sharing. God bless all of you who are sharing right now. I really appreciate you all. Okay, let's get into our conversation for today. Auntie Mary, thank you for hosting a watch party as this broadcast is going on. You just reminded me of that too. God bless you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for hosting a watch party. Uh, watch with us. Thank you. All right. So let's get to the heart of our today. I'm going to be sharing with you what I call the 12 foxes of relationships and marriages. The 12 foxes that destroys relationships and marriages. You can see that on my screen. The 12 major foxes that destroys, that ravages, that invades, that weakens, that devours, that ultimately results in the breakdown of single relationships and married relationships. What I'm about to share with you now if you've had a divorce before, or if you are separated before, you're going to find the operation of one of these foxes. You're going to find one or two, three 
that have been very, very responsible for the breakdown in your relationship. And if you are still in a relationship or a marriage, if you are having a conflict or your marriage is troubled, you are likely going to identify one of the foxes that I'm about to mention that perhaps have been let loose in your marriage. Such a fox needs to be identified, captured, and taken out of your relationship. Otherwise, foxes have the capacity to destroy relationships. Let me give you a simple illustrative story. In Judges chapter 6, there was a man by the name Samson. The Bible made us to understand that when Samson wanted to destroy the harvest of the Philistines, the Bible said that Samson gathered 300 foxes and he set fire in their tail and released them into the harvest field. And those foxes destroyed everything. It's therefore critical for you to understand that foxes have the capacity to destroy. I'm going to say that again. Foxes have the capacity to destroy. Whatever you allow foxes to access, foxes will destroy. You want to write that down. Whatever you allow foxes to access, foxes will destroy. That's a very powerful statement to think about. Whatever you allow foxes to access, foxes will destroy. Go ahead and share, just write that down so somebody can read it. Whatever you allow foxes to access, foxes will destroy. Now let's quickly take a look at a little biblical uh, text so we can use it for our conversation today. In Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, in verse 14 to 16. Songs of Solomon. I know a lot of you have not read that book of the Bible before, but I'm going to read it for you. Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, in verse 14 to verse 16. Oh, my doe. This is, this is a romantic and poetic way to talk to your partner. Oh, my dove, that art in the cleft of the rocks. In the secret places of the stairs. Let me see your countenance. Oh my God. Somebody's already falling in love with these poetic words. All right? <laughs> Let me see your countenance. Let me hear your voice. For sweet is thy voice. And thy countenance is comely. Verse 15. Take us, the foxes. The little foxes that spoil the vine. For our vines have tender grapes. Take us the foxes. The little foxes that spoils the vines. See that foxes are spoilers. Foxes are spoilers. When they enter your vine... They spoil your vine. Now when it comes to animal science, we have been made to understand by those who study foxes that foxes are omnivorous. You know we have herbivorous, carnivorous, and then we have omnivorous. Omnivorous animals are those who eat both uh, flesh and uh, they also eat plants. And foxes eat both. So they are omnivorous. What that tells you is that foxes eat anything that they see. They eat meat. If they don't see meat, they will eat vegetable. If they don't find vegetable, they will eat the meat that they find. The bottom line is, if you allow a fox to get into your space, they eat up whatever they find. So if you had meat, when foxes come, they eat up the meat in the space until you have no meat left. If you had plants, when foxes come, they eat up the plants. Somebody's getting it. 
They eat up what you have. It doesn't matter what it is. Their job is to eat it up. And today I'm about to show you 12 foxes that eats up the love, the passion, that eats up the joy, that eats up the commitment, that eats up, you know, the intimacy that people have in relationship. Trust me, what I'm about to share with you today will tremendously help you. I hope I can finish it. If you know couples, if you know men, women, singles who are going through relationship crisis, text them and just let them join us right about now. Can I reestablish the fact that foxes are omnivorous? What that means is that they eat up whatever they find. If they find meat, they will eat it up. If they find vegetable, they will eat up the vegetable. Their assignment is to spoil your vibe. Is it possible sometimes that you are blaming the vine or blaming your vineyard and you are not seeing the fox? So as I use the word fox, I want you to know today that I'm using the word fox as a metaphor. The word fox is a metaphor for actions, attitudes, and behaviors that devours and destroys the vital elements of your relationship and marriage. Foxes are metaphors. I'm only using the word fox to talk about the attitude. I'm talking about the actions, the behaviors that actually destroys and devours the vital life in your relationship and your marriage. Sometimes you are attacking the person without identifying the action. And until you identify the action, until you identify the attitude and the behavior that drives the instability in your marriage, you might not be able to fix it. And here's where the problem lies. Those who don't see the at attitude, the actions and the behavior will be blinded by the person. So you will attack the person when you need to isolate quarantine, the attitude and the behavior. You will misinterpret the attitude that is not friendly. You will misinterpret it for your spouse who is not friendly. See, the attitude is not friendly. It doesn't mean that the person is not friendly. This is a tricky part to deal with. Let me give you an example, and I'm going to use so that I don't go into anybody's marriage. Let me give you an example of my marriage with the permission of my wife. Now, here's what happened some years ago. About 18, there, I think about 18 years ago, I bought something. I think I bought a shoe for my wife. I took my time. I, I take my time to buy things for my wife. I take my time. So I took my time to buy this precious shoe for my wife. And, and, and when I got back home, uh, my wife was in the kitchen. So I took the shoe and I kept it on. We had this, we had this stand. Uh, it's, it's an uh, wrought iron stand uh, with glass on it. And then you have a mirror right in front of it. I, you can't forget such moments in your life. You know, so I bought the shoe and I kept it right there on top. And, and I went to my wife and, and I like, sweetheart, how are you? She was in the kitchen. And I said, hey, how are you? And uh, I bought something for you. And, and listen, you see, when I said I bought something for you, what I had in mind was the movie that I watched. See. I've watched a lot of Indian films before in the 80s and in the early 90s. I used to watch Dramendra, you know. 
I used to watch Johnny Man. You know, when these Indian guys will go buy something for their women, and, and, and when they bring this gift, the woman will, will go on her knees, she will sing a song, she will kiss the guy on his legs and kiss him upward and hug him. And I didn't know I was dreaming. So I, I was expecting new couple. I was expecting that a wife sees this stuff in my mind. I was expecting the movie that my wife would like, oh my God, oh my gosh, you know, wow. You bought this for me. And my wife will fall on the ground, kiss me up, you know, hug me. My wife came out and just looked at the shoe and she said, thank you. And my wife went back into the kitchen. I'm like, what just, wait. Okay, even if the movie didn't happen. <laughs> even if the movie didn't happen. Can there be some kind of nice behavior? I mean, she was just like, thank you. And she went back into the kitchen. Now, listen. The danger is for me to associate that behavior with the person of my wife and throw the baby and the bathwater together away. But I was patient even though I was wounded. I was patient enough to isolate that behavior from my wife. It's called a clinical approach to dealing with your spouse. When doctors want to treat a patient, they are looking for what is making the patient to misbehave. When a patient is throwing a feet, when a patient is sweating all over, a clinical approach requires that you try to find what is wrong with the person. As concluding, as against concluding that the person is wrong. The person is manifesting wrong behaviors and action. Doesn't necessarily mean that the person is wrong. Ah, uh, this is very tough. Now, as I began to think about what happened when my wife did what she did, uh, by virtue of my training as a science person, one of the things that science has taught us is not to generally react and be, and be a little bit emotional. That is why if you notice what's going on in the coronavirus, with this coronavirus, listen to what you hear people say. You will hear in the United Kingdom, in the United States, even here in Africa, you will hear, let's follow the science. Let's use science and data to make decisions and not emotions. Let's not allow what we see to make us make uninformed decisions. Let's cut through and clearly understand scientifically when data driving our decisions. So I decided to figure out why my wife behaved the way she did. And guess what I found out? I got to realize that my wife's love language was act of service. My wife's love language is not gift. At that time, now my wife receives gift. And a lot of it. Very serious gift. She has matured into receiving gifts. <laughs> but that time, no, no, no. My wife wants act of service. So here was where the problem lied. My wife was expecting when I got back home that I was going to come into the kitchen and identify with her. Unfortunately, my ancestors didn't teach me that. See where the problem lies. So my ancestors didn't coach me. There wasn't a coaching program from my ancestors. The men in my bloodline didn't coach me on how to handle a woman. They may have told us to marry, but they didn't tell us how to manage women in marriage. So long and short of it, I stumbled on a research called Genderlect. 
And that was when I got to realize that I wasn't speaking love in the language that my wife will understand. I discovered that I was trying to communicate love to my wife in a way I like to communicate love, not in the way she likes to receive love. Don't forget where our conversation started from. Now I will funnel down. Here's the point I was tr- I've been trying to make. I would have used that isolated incident where my wife treated my gift with that sense of, you know, no appreciation. I would have treated it as she is not an appreciative person. See the difference? She is a very appreciative person. The challenge was that that day, she wanted me to appreciate her too. I was supposed to identify with her. So here's what I'm saying. As people in relationship, it is critical for you to isolate behaviors, actions, and attitude. Learn to isolate quarantine and study it away from trying to personalize it or give it a, pers- a personality. Don't give the action a personality. All right, all right, all right. Okay? Let me see. Yeah, Queen Glenda, thank you so very much for recommending the book, and I recommend it too. Get the book, The Five Love Language by Gary Chapman. I'm sure that book is going to do a lot of great job for you. All right? So let's get going now. We're dealing with the 12 foxes, actions, attitudes, and behaviors that weakens and destroys the vital life in every relationship and marriage. Now remember that I said that when foxes come into a place, when they come into a place, anything they see, they eat it up. In the same vein, the foxes, the attitude, the behaviors, the actions that I'm about to mention now, if they come into your relationship, they can eat up the vital life in your relationship. They can destroy the life in your relationship. So let's get started. The first fox, the first action, attitude, behavior that destroys marriages. I'm talking about the 12 foxes that destroys relationship. Number one is what I call irresponsibility. Irresponsibility. This is one of the major foxes that is destroying the vital life in marriages and relationships. When one partner is overburdened by the needs and overburdened with the roles, with the responsibilities in the relationship, whilst the other person is just there and not contributing but consuming, When a partner in the relationship is not doing what the partner should do and allows the other person to be the only person driving the progress, stability, and the life of that relationship, that fox of irresponsibility will soon eat away the joy, the love, the passion that the other party who is a contributing party, used to have for the partner. Are you getting how it works now? I told you this is really going to be deep today. Now watch this carefully. If A and B are in a relationship, and A is the one that is carrying the burden, A is the one giving, A is the one texting, A is the one providing, A is the one protecting, A is the one doing 75 to 80% of what is making the marriage work. Whereas B 
is on the consuming, receiving side. And not because of the fact that B is incapacitated or B is for any reason able to contribute. It's just that B doesn't contribute. See, after a while, this fox of irresponsibility will eat into the love that A has for B, such that over time, A will begin to lose passion for the marriage because the irresponsibility of B is already eating into the love and the passion of A. <laughs> so think deeply about what I've just said now. In your marriage, are you responsible? If the man is the woman is the one paying all the bill, she pays house rent, she pays children's school fees, she goes to work, she comes back to cook, and then she gives sex to the husband, and she not trusts the kids, and she has to watch over the dog outside, and she has to protect the children from mosquitoes and the rest of that. If the woman keeps doing all of that, and the man is not rising up to be responsible. After a while, that box of irresponsibility in the man will eat into the respect that the woman used to have for him. The box of irresponsibility that the man is allowing to, is allowing to run loose in the relationship will eat up the honor, the love, the passion, the respect that his wife used to have for him. Because foxes devour and destroy the vital life of every relationship and marriage. If all that the man knows how to do is to dress up, and the wife is the one that buys the dress, drive the car, she's the one that fills up the gas. And then, of course, when it's time to travel, she pays the bill. The question is, what is your contribution in the house? You don't have to be as rich as your wife, but you need to make sure that you are practically involved in the life of the family. If you can't provide so much money, how about helping her to take up some burdens? Who says a man? can watch over the children. Who says that a man can help do the groceries and help do the dishes, help do the cooking? Don't allow traditional uh, mindset to make you begin to lose your marriage. In the same vein, if a man is the one who is the breadwinner, he's bringing the money, the man is, uh, is the one, he gets back home again. He has to think about what the kids will eat. The man gets back home. He has to fix the lights. The house is disorderly. He has to rearrange the house. And there is a wife in the house. And the only thing you do as a wife is watch movie. And call friends. And change channels. And paint your nails. And add extended eyelashes. And, and then again, when it gets to the night time. And the man wants to have intimacy with you. You are tired. The question is, what have you been doing all day? You've done nothing all day and then you're tired at night. And the one who has worked all day cannot be rewarded at night. So you see, over time, that generous man will eventually begin to withdraw his generosity. He will begin to withdraw his love, his passion for you because you have allowed the fox of irresponsibility to get into your marriage, you are not doing what you are supposed to be doing. You are supposed to be responsible to your husband and responsible for your husband. In the same vein as a husband, you are supposed to be responsible to your wife and responsible for your wife and you are responsible for your children. The fox of irresponsibility destroys marriages and relationships. Number two is the fox of unfaithfulness. 
the fox of unfaithfulness. We are talking about unfaithful attitude, unfaithful actions, unfaithful behaviors. And to be unfaithful means you are not faithful. You are not faithful to your words. You are not faithful to your promise. You are not faithful to your vows. You are not faithful to your partner. You are not faithful to the promise you made to the person. Unfaithful attitude, actions, and behaviors can actually become foxes that will destroy a marriage with a potential future. The love your wife has for you can be eroded. The respect your wife has for you, the honor that your wife used to have for you can be eroded if you allow the fox of unfaithfulness to come into your marriage and relationship. It's critical to recognize that. When the trust of your partner is constantly being violated. The trust that she has for you, the trust that your husband has in you, when the trust is constantly being violated by your unfaithful behaviors online, you are constantly being caught chatting with a strange man somewhere, such an unfaithful behavior can actually cause a man who truly loves you to sign out. And don't forget that marriages can come to an end on the ground of unfaithfulness. So unfaithful behaviors, which includes violation of trust or betrayal of confidence or the overthrow of your vows as a couple, it can lead actually to the destruction of your marriage and the destabilization of the same. So we have what we call the fox of unfaithfulness. It is that fox that will make you to say to your wife or your husband or your sweetheart, the person you want to marry, I'm just going to see my friend. And you take off and you go somewhere else and spend time with somebody else. You are in the house and you are denying your partner of intimacy. Whereas you are having intimacy online with somebody else. You are in chat rooms. You get into bathroom. You get into your bathroom with your phone. And you are exposing your nakedness to somebody somewhere else. Such unfaithful action and behavior can eventually destroy your marriage. The very fabric of your relationship and marriage can be destroyed by the fox of unfaithfulness. You are married to your husband, but then you also have a vibrator. When your husband is not important, you deny him of sex, but you give vibrator sex as much as vibrator wants or you want. I'm going to be practical with you. Such unfaithful behavior can destroy a marriage. You are still in touch with your ex, and you are married, and you still shy in a very romantic way, with your ex. It's unfaithful. And by the way, let me say something. The problem with unfaithfulness in marriage is that usually unfaithful actions, attitudes, and behaviors are usually covert. They are usually secreted. The challenge with that is that God sees every unfaithful behavior that is carried out in the secret. Unfortunately, there is a law that has been put in motion by God. And the law is this. Whatever is done in the secret, it will, it must, not it may, it will one day come to the surface. 
to unfaithful actions, attitudes, and behaviors may be covered for years. But one day, they will be unmasked. They will be uncovered. And these are the things that are eating at the core of our marriages. I, I told you that I was coming deep today on some issues. And if, if you know friends, listen, I, I am burdened. I am burdened. And if, if this doesn't bother you, let me give you an understanding of the dilemma that we find ourselves in. Are you aware that every divorce, every divorce, where a child is involved. I hope you know that such a divorce will never leave that child to be a normal child again. Seventy-five percent of kids who have mental health issues, who are on drugs, who are into prostitution, gangsterism. A lot of young people who end up going into prostitution, check back. They come from dysfunctional family background. They come from divorce homes. Check for young people who don't want to get married again. They saw something they don't like or they didn't like when they were growing up. Divorce doesn't just affect the two parties who divorce. Divorce affects the kids who are involved. Somebody is already on the, listen, somebody somewhere in your city right now, someone in your church, because of the ignorance of what I'm talking about here, they are already filing for a divorce. And they will divorce thinking that they are irreconcilably different. Whereas the reality is that they carry so much burden of ignorance. The man is ignorant. The woman is ignorant. Two ignorant people, unfortunately, can make a marriage work. China has over 3 million divorces annually for the last two, three years. Watch this carefully. As we go apart, we carry the poison of pain from the previous relationship. Let me give you a research that, that was discovered. Have you noted that people who have had a divorce can easily walk away from anything? Once I can walk away from my partner that I entered into a vow with, I can walk away again from anything, anyone, any company, any organization. I can walk away from a church. At the slightest provocation, if I couldn't endure the one at all, I'm never going to endure with anybody anymore. So you see, the, the ripple effect of this in society is not small. Quitting, quitting is one of the worst addictions. Once you start quitting, you continue to quit. The other side of divorce is that if you have boys in a divorce and girls in a divorce, let me give you an example. If a boy was a victim of a divorced parent and the boy stays with his mom, the boys naturally are sympathetic with moms. So here's where the problem lies. That boy, because he's sympathetic to his mom, will always have disregard for his father. That's not where it ends. Such a boy will find it difficult to submit under any male authority. I want you to take time and check out for men who find it difficult to submit under the authority of other men. They, they are men who grew up with their mom sympathetically against their father. If they never submitted to their father, if they never liked their father, if they were angry at their father, they will never find it easy to submit under another man. And here's where the problem lies. That dysfunctional life of not being able to submit under another man 
it's going to cause them also to repeat the errors of their father. Because not submitting under a man means nobody else can talk to me. If my father couldn't talk to me, another man can't talk to me. And if another man can't talk to me, then I'm not going to learn from anybody. And if I don't learn from anybody, I'm going to make lots of mistakes in my life. Check men who came from divorced, separated families and they were sympathetic to their moms. Check such men except through salvation, through the invasion of the word of God, change of orientation, change of disposition. Only then will their actions be changed. And the first proof that a man who came from a divorced family, the first proof that that man has been healed is that the man will seek to submit under another man. That is the acid test. <laughs> this is getting really deep today. And... Uh, Oh my God, our time is up. I think I will stop. But I'm supposed to share 12 with you and I'm only two. <laughs> the fox of unfaithfulness, it ravages marriages. It destroys relationships. It pulls down families. And the reason for all of that it's ignorance. I'll give you one more. And then we'll continue tomorrow. It's what I call the fox of rigidity. The fox of rigidity. Stubborn attitude. Inflexible behaviors. Positions that don't easily change. Lack of emotions. When you take a position, you don't care about any other person's position. Inability to welcome another opinion. Overly controlling position. Such a fox can steal the joy out of a relationship. And those of you that are married to such men or women, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you that are in relationship with such a man or woman, you know what I'm talking about. You have lost your joy in the relationship because the fox of rigidity has been let loose in your relationship, uncontained, unquarantined, unidentified. Rigidity, unwillingness to change, taking a hard stand. My position is my position. As it was, so it is, and so shall it be, world without end. You know me. That is, and you know, when people with the fox of rigidity start talking, you hear statements like, listen. You know that is who I am. I know I cannot change. You know that is, that's how you married me. That's how you married me. It's my position. It's the way I am. I can't change. Hello, sir. Hello, ma. One of the latest discovery ever made in the world of psychology is that there is no personality now that cannot be altered. So nobody should hide under the guise of, you know, I can't change. No, sir. You can change in just 90 days. There are programs you can actually run that can alter your previous behavior in 30 days. So stop holding on to something that is not healthy. It's destroying your relationship and you are still protecting, excusing it. My words are final. Like it is the law of the Medes and the Persia. Even the Ten Commandments, the Bible says God has done away with them. Listen, you hear what I said? The Ten Commandments that God made, he has done away with them. Why is your own commandment fixed like the Statue of Liberty? 
We live in a dynamic society where everything is in a constant state of motion and change. Society is shifting. Our world will never be the same because of coronavirus. Schools will never be the same again. Any school that wants to remain analog will soon close down because a major seismic shift has taken place in our world. If the world can change from manual typewriter to where we are today, voice command, if the world can change from telephones, you remember the telephone, the one you ring? If the world can change into mobile phone, who says you can't change? The world has changed. You have remained the same. Only God is the one that the Bible has tried such thing to. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Only God. And when we say God doesn't change, we're talking about the character of God. The methods of God change. He changes his methods. It's only his nature. It's only his holiness, his righteousness, his mercifulness. Those ones, they don't change. The same God who said, Abraham, go to the mountain, kill your son. When Abraham got to the mountain and was to kill his son, God said, hey, stop. I changed my mind. Kill a ram. Don't kill your son. Why are you so rigid? What do you gain? What do you gain by being so rigid at the expense of the joy of your partner? Who are you trying to prove a point to? That you are a hard person. That you are my great toucher. Who are you trying to prove a point to? You are losing your marriage. You are losing a woman that God has sent into your life. Your rigidity is destroying her. You are destroying a man that God has sent into your life by your hard position, your unwillingness to change. What are you protecting? What are you afraid of losing by giving up rigidity for flexibility, for adaptability, for inclusion? Throw down the walls. It was Ronald Reagan that said to Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, throw down these walls. Hello, sir. Throw down the walls of rigidity. Ma'am. Throw down the walls of rigidity. You are too hard. And this rigidity is stealing, killing, destroying the joy of your relationship. You are winning. You are winning in the sense that your position is fixed and it's not changing. And so you are feared. You are respected as somebody whose position doesn't change. But you are losing your partner. You are losing your marriage. You are losing your relationship. The fox of rigidity is destroying marriages. Madam, don't be too rigid. It's not one way. There are many ways. Hello, sir. It's not one way. There are many ways. My time is gone and I must respect your time. I'll continue tomorrow. By the grace of God, I'm sure this has been a blessing to you. Don't forget, do us a favor. If you can share it with some persons on your platforms, make sure we rescue marriages. I've mentioned three foxes today. A fox of irresponsibility that makes a partner to be a consumer and not a contributor. That makes a partner not to participate in carrying the burdens of the family and allow somebody else to carry the burden. Whilst you are alive and you are not incapacitated. It's a fox of irresponsibility. That will make you, when it's time to pay school fees, you run out of the house or you fall sick. And then when the bills have been paid, you come back to normal or return home. It's the fox of irresponsibility. And righteous people are responsible. 
Jesus taught us to be responsible. When there was a storm and his disciples' lives were threatened, he stood up and spoke to the storm. That is being responsible for the people under your custody. The disciples also, when Jesus finished preaching, they knew he was going somewhere else to preach. The disciples went to get a ship, a boat, for their master. And they got a boat that had an inner part where the master who has been preaching can find a place to rest. It's like a husband and wife relationship. He is responsible for them. They are responsible to him. There is a symbiotic, mutually beneficial relationship where everybody is doing something to make the relationship work. Where nobody is a taker, but everybody is a giver. We are a different generation. Let's be different. Brothers, men, step up. Step up. I know your, the women these days are more prone to get higher jobs and get higher pay. Higher pay. That's okay, sir. You don't need to compete with your wife in the area of income, but you can still be the man. Your masculinity is not defined by how much money you can provide, but by how much care, love, affection, intimacy you can provide. Responsibility. Taking your responsibility. Making sure that you are the man in the house. Like God will want you to be the man in the house. That you will love your wife as Christ loved the church. Ephesians chapter 5. Love her enough to give yourself for her. I'm not even talking about giving money. That you are able to give yourself for her. Husband, that is the standard that God is calling men to. God is not calling you as a man to be a husband like your father. No. God is not calling you as a man to be a husband like your friend. No. God is not calling you as a man to be a husband like your, your brother. No. Husbands, love your wife as Christ. Love the church. Our model is Christ. Jesus is the model for all men. I am not yet like Jesus. I'm aspiring every day. I'm pressing towards the mark of that high calling. I want to be able to die in the end of my life, saying to myself, myself, I died as a husband that Christ was to his wife. That God becomes the model of a father to all of us, not your father. Christ, God, becomes the model of who a father is. It's time for us to step up as men. And as women, it's time for you to step up your game too. It's time for you to uh, submit to your husband. It's the church does to Christ. In fact, it's so serious that the Bible says, even if your husband is an unbeliever, the Bible says, by the life you leave, your husband will come to the knowledge of Christ. Woman of God. God is counting on you to be a reflection of the church in your household. The fox of irresponsibility, unwillingness to take up my responsibility. Now here's where the problem lies. Sometimes I don't want to do what I'm supposed to do on the account that since my partner is not doing, me too I'm not doing. And that one too is saying since she's not doing, I'm Nobody's doing anything. The wisest amongst the two of you will be the first doer. The wisest amongst the two of you will continue to do even when the other person is not reciprocating. The fox of unfaithfulness, making sure that you keep to the promise, the vows you've made, Making sure fidelity instead of infidelity defines your life. Making sure that in the absence of your spouse, your words are your bonds. Your bonds. 
making sure that whether he is there or she is not there, that you are keeping to the promise you made to one another. It is faithfulness. The reverse of it is unfaithfulness. It is what makes people in the absence of each other compromise, weaken, distort, and eventually destroy the vows that they make to each other. And lastly, I mentioned to you today the fox of rigidity, inflexibility, hard stands. Not yielding, not giving up, not, not listening, speaking, and negotiating. Always wanting to be the one who wins. Always wanting to make sure your argument supersedes other arguments. Always wanting to make sure it's your way or no other way. No, that is not Christ. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let's embrace the mind of Christ. As we are called the followers of Christ, let's embrace the mind of Christ. Let me share with you what the mind of Christ is, which negates this force of rigidity. Now, the Bible said they brought a woman to Jesus, and they said, we caught her in the very act of adultery. And master, according to the law, she should be stoned to death. What do you say? That is the law. Jesus bent down, stooped on the ground, wrote on the sands of time. By the time he stood up, he said to them, anyone among you that does not have any secret in your own cupboard, go ahead and throw a stone. One after the other, they were gone. Jesus, the high priest of our profession, looked at the woman and said, neither do I condemn you. Flexibility. The law say condemn her. Flexibility say just allow it. Let love prevail. Let love prevail. Oh, pastor, no, no, no. You know, I come from a family where they are so disciplined. What did you become by that? My challenge, there is a place for discipline. There is a place where we need to maintain certain etiquettes in the family. But I'm saying overall in a relationship, can we be like Christ? He met with a woman by the well. Jesus met a woman by the well. She had had five husbands before him or six. And amazingly, when Jesus ministered to her, the woman decided to go to the city to bring the people. She went to preach to the people in the city to bring them to Christ. Jesus did not say, hey, madam, come back. You know your life has been a very crooked life and uh, you can't go and preach. You can't go and invite people. No. Jesus didn't, he didn't do that. Can we be like Christ? Oh, how much I want to be like him. Oh, how much I stretch daily, how much I pray daily that I just may be like him. I don't want to end up as any other man. I want to end up like Christ. Please don't miss tomorrow's broadcast in the morning. We are having David and Nicole Binion anointed worship leaders from the United States. They'll be joining us tomorrow morning. What a moment we had today with David Hernandez. If you missed it, ask anybody who perhaps is online. What it was a moment today. The healings, the miracles, the word that we received. A woman sent a testimony today from London. Here is her testimony. For 30 years, she has, not been, she has been having eye problems and couldn't see for 30 years without her glasses. Today, since morning, she says she just noticed that she had no need for the glasses anymore. During the prayer, she was supernaturally healed. 30 years. Tomorrow will be another remarkable time. I look forward to seeing you. And then in the evening, we'll continue with the 12 foxes. That destroys marriages. I love you so very much. God's blessings be with you.